it petrifies me every single time we go on to an episode and we sit down and we do this. Having a goal and having a purpose, they're the two big things that I think relight the energy or the fire underneath me. Where would you start on a nutrition front? I mean, the starting point has to be just getting an understanding of where you are. I've been in a place where my training was okay, but my nutrition wasn't that great. When I think about the bigger picture, I probably wasn't in a very good place. There's a long answer and there's a short answer. And the short answer essentially is it's just awful. Welcome back to the T2 Fit Talks podcast, where we aim to educate and inspire individuals to achieve their full potential. My name is Luke and I am today's host. We have got the man, the myth, the legend, the man normally running things behind the microphone, running T2 Fit Talks. He's passed over the mic and he's allowed me to take over this podcast, this episode, uh, to get to know you a little bit better. So JC, welcome. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, we're going to keep this short and sweet. We had a lot of people asking uh, some questions about JT. So we thought let's designate a whole episode to JT, getting to know him a little bit more, testing him a little bit. And by the end of this episode, you're going to know JT a whole lot more. So we're going to start this off with a nice light warm up question. Okay. Lovely. What's your favorite part about being host on T2 Fit Talks? I thought this would be a relevant one because... You know, you've been, what we, seven episodes in now? Mm -hmm. What's been your favorite part of taking that over and, and running that from the ground up? Um, it's a tricky one. I, anyone who knows me well will, will know that being just on a podcast, let alone being the host of it, is extremely out of my comfort zone. Um, and when, when the opportunity kind of came about when we kind of sat down and started to speak about it, um, it, it was a scary thing for me. I always thought it was gonna be a real scary thing. And it is, it's daunting. Um, being behind the microphone, being in front of a camera. Um, but it was one, one of the things at the start of this year that, again, we kind of sat down and spoke about was really putting myself in positions this year that are going to challenge me. So I think that's going to be the biggest thing. That's my biggest kind of takeaway and enjoyment is, although it petrifies me every single time we go on to an episode and we sit down and we do this, it's the sense of kind of achievement of overcoming that. Mm. Um, being out of my comfort zone, which like I say was one of the, big kind of things this year was my big goal be in uncomfortable situations more often um, but almost intentionally putting myself there so every time that we um, set one of these podcasts up it, it is an uncomfortable situation for me yeah. and it's learning to kind of ways to cope with that and get better at it um, so there's a, a big self-development side yeah. um, but also it's just it's good to probably further my knowledge on certain subjects and areas as well um, so again, pre and postnatal is an example. I've got a rough idea about that kind of stuff, but when you're hosting a podcast on it, you've got to know that a bit more inside out and you know, think about the questions and the details around it. So it's an opportunity for me to go away and delve a little bit deeper into certain subjects, which is great. So it's, it's an opportunity for me to learn on the actual subject side, but there's a real big kind of personal development thing there about being in uncomfortable situations more often intentionally. Yeah. I love that. I won't ask you what your favorite episode has been, but there is another question here around podcasts. So mm -hmm. while we're on the topic of podcasts, someone has asked, what podcast does JT listen to? Uh, in brackets, he's so good at them, by the way. Well, firstly, I appreciate that. Um, I, I don't listen to loads of podcasts, and, I, and I, I really wish I did. It's just prioritizing it more and more and, and kind of getting out. I'm actually, I, I say in that, I actually did listen to one this morning. Um, I listen to Chris Williams and podcast yeah. with um, Alex Hormozion, um, which is a really, really good episode. Um, but yeah, I, the podcast initially for me came about in the form of a Joe Rogan podcast, um, which I think probably a lot of people did. Um, and I think David Goggins was probably the first one that I listened to. On Joe Rogan. On Joe Rogan, yeah. And I just, I just, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And there's some real nice nuggets and, and bits you can take away from those podcasts. I listened to a few of Rogan's, um, but I, yeah, I, my horizon should be broader with, with different podcasts for sure. We did a little bit of research on various bits and bobs when we first started looking at um, creating T2 Fit Talks, but none that I really kind of stuck with. Um, and actually we realized that what we were doing here with podcasts, although in very much in its infancy, um, was actually really high quality. Um, you know, the, even just down to the sound and the audio and, and, and things. So um, yeah, I've, I've not branched out as much as I probably should have done. Rogan was definitely one of the first ones for me. Um, Chris Williamson, I think is gonna be uh, one of my next ones to really delve a little bit deeper into. 
And I think Diary of a, C Diary of a CEO mm -hmm. um, is probably another one on the horizon for me that I'll delve a bit deeper into bit by bit. But I like, I like taking little nuggets away. Um, but I actually really like all the shorts and stuff as well. That, mm. you know, so you see on YouTube or um, that kind of real main takeaway points. I love that. But I also, on the other side, like popping, again, the Chris Williamson one on. I was walking a dog this morning. Oh. Went into the ears, dog walk, nice and easy. It was on, uh, in the car on the way here. I need to start doing that bit more. Um, but yeah, so probably not as extensive on the knowledge side of that as it yeah. probably should be, but they're my main ones. Love it, love it. So obviously you've been in the health and fitness industry for, was it over a decade now? So kind of, yeah, you know, mate. Yeah. Too old, but <laughs> don't. don't. Uh, someone's asked, can you share a story that is embedded in your memory of a particular client's journey slash transformation? Whether it's here, whether it's previous experiences at other gyms, can you think back to a time when, you know, Something's really sat with you with a transformation you've had. I think there's, 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 uh, there's actually two. There's two that really jump out to me. Back when I first started at Virgin, at Virgin Active, over in Bromley, that was one of my, well, it was my first PT role. And they probably just stick out because I was very much in my infancy uh, of doing that as a job. And then I remember I had one, one client, it's quite a young fella, guy, uh, his name was Ben. And he came to me and he was the first client that I had who tr fully trusted everything that I said like if I said to him Ben go and like jump around in the corner for 15 minutes <laughs> this this guy would have done it for sure I didn't do that but he would have done it yeah and that was amazing to have someone who really really trusts what you're saying and what you're about and off the back of that he had a fantastic transformation he lost a load of weight he got really strong he changed his whole lifestyle and I didn't actually realize until about maybe six months into um, actually training with him and I was training with him for about a year that his main goal of getting into the gym and then actually starting some PT was he, um, he basically wanted to try and find a girlfriend. Wow. That was his big thing. And I was like, oh, okay, that, that's, that's amazing. I wish I'd known that, that kind of sooner. Um, but it, you could see his confidence growing as he was more consistent with his training, as he saw the results more and more, his, uh, his, um, his confidence went through the roof and the reason that it kind of stuck not was for a few reasons again it was someone really trusting me for probably the first time in that job role really seeing the evidence of that work being put into place but actually now long term the girlfriend that he got he now has married and has a kid with wow so kind of seeing that right from the word go all the way through to yeah. uh, seeing him on instagram or uh, facebook post up a picture with that girl friend that he he got um that That's was really powerful. really rewarding yeah. just being part of that um so that was one thing and the other one actually was the second client i ever had and it was i i really remember it probably for the wrong reasons um and she was a really tricky client a really really tricky client and it was more around the fact that i in that in those early stages i didn't have the tools to help her as i should have done if you see what I mean I, I wish I had something else to give her it wasn't the fact that we were doing things wrong on the gym floor or anything like that you know, there was nutritional advice and guidance but actually I, I think she needed more than that she needed more of a buy-in and for me it was I guess not clarity but an understanding that there was a bit of a hole in what I could offer as a coach and as a, as a trainer that I needed to fix I think it's one of those things at the same time that only comes with time in that job role and learning more, but also just my mindset being a bit different. Mm. Um, I've mentioned a number of times to different people in various platforms that I was quite militant as a PT when I first started and I probably didn't give her enough time and respect that maybe I should have done because it was like, well, you're not coming in and hitting this hard and there's no blood, sweat, tears, like what's going on? Actually, but probably what she needed was more of the emotional side and she needed probably a conversation, a mm. chat, offload, understand more about what's going on from a kind of personal standpoint, home life. I didn't have those tools in my, in my kind of toolbox at the time. So there was a, you know, a real positive side to that. But then the negative, I guess, side is understanding and appreciating that there was way more to being a coach and a trainer than, than the skills I had at the time. Yeah. Yeah, and how would how old were you at this point? It's a very good point. Twenty one. Okay. Twenty one when I first. So when did you get in. qualified as a as a coach? Where? 
No, when? Uh, 20. I was 20 years old. Wow. Yeah, I came out of, I came out of a job that I was just kind of in with yeah. no real passion for it. I was living down in Dorset at the time. Um, that kind of came to an end and I was like, I need to find something else. And a really good friend of mine, um, Scott, had just kind of started his training to be a PT. And um, he was like, why are you not doing this? You, you'd be perfect for this. And trusting a good friend, I kind of like threw myself into it. And um, I was like, right, let's just, let's just get cracking. Yeah. So I started I'd love to see what was going on in the industry back then, because I know I've been in the industry coming up to 10 years now and so much has changed just mm -hmm. like what I would even work with, with a client and how the kind of science has changed, mm -hmm. the kind of things that we have access to like podcasts. Yep. There's, there's so many resources online that we can get and understand and have a better knowledge um, at our fingertips. But what was it like back then with like clients and, and was there, you know, I think back to when I was a coach initially, it was like start a client on a treadmill, get them warm, get them doing hit and sprints and all that kind of stuff. Weight training, resistance training was just starting to come in. But what was it like when you got into the industry? I think very much the same. Like you, when you're training up, you very much kind of go through a, a checklist and a tick box of things that you must do. So there must be a pulse raiser. Like you say, it's probably going to yeah. be on a treadmill for five minutes, going to increase the intensity. You do a little bit of mobility or whatever, if you were lucky and you kind of go into your first exercise, it's going to be fixed resistance or whatever it is. Um, so initially it was like that. However, because I'd been in kind of a rugby background, I'd had exposure to different kind of, I guess, training methods and modalities. I had a little bit more in my toolbox that I could use, that word kind of functional type stuff. And I had the use of kettlebells and yeah. a bit more body weight type stuff. I had a slightly better understanding of mobility and, and things like that. So I could draw on that a little bit. But when I think back to my course, it was, you know, less about, I guess quality of the movement and periodization and program design and progression, all those kind of things. It was very much of, I actually remember one of the tasks, one of the assessments that we had, there was like a, a two meter by two meter square on the floor. And we had a BOSU ball, uh, maybe a Viper or something like that at the time. And it was like, you've got to design a 15 or a 20 minute session within a two by two box. And I was like, when well, I think back on it now, actually, it's like, that's insane. Yeah, it was actually quite a weird, weirdly good one to do because when I really packed gym floor at Virgin, it I was going to say they really, must really have known well. COVID was coming. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so they, they, there was probably a reason behind it, but that that kind of stuff became more of a, a priority to them, yeah, than the stuff that actually really mattered, and how we were really going to get people progression, yeah, than just how do I deliver them kind of a probably a quite haphazard session in a two by two square. Um, I was, I wish there was more stuff, like you say, the podcast and more self-development stuff around mm. at the time. There wasn't that much. Yeah, you're relying more on the people around you, right? To level yeah, you up or courses. But even then, like, it's very hard to kind of get your fingertips on, on that sort of stuff. So let's move on to your training. Mm -hmm. So obviously we know you, you've made it quite well known. Well, if you don't know, we're currently working on a high rocks, getting in shape for a sub 60 minute, which is a later question. <laughs> but Somebody asked, what motivates you when the everyday stresses get in the way and how does he re-energize himself? So what motivates you when you feel stressed and how does that energize you? Um, I think the big thing for me is having, having a goal and having a purpose. They're the two big things that I think relight the energy or the fire underneath me when you know there's stressful times or days where I don't really feel like it I'm someone who really enjoys having a, a deadline a high rocks is a perfect example knowing that November 25th there's going to be a high rocks event and I need to make sure that I'm in decent shape for that I like having that little bit of like a accountability should we say but also just a purpose and it hasn't even got to be around training training is great again the purpose of high rocks is amazing but understanding I have a purpose just in daily life, home life, work life, that kind of stuff is, is really powerful. And again, probably actually something that I've only really started to appreciate more since actually coming here just over a year ago. But I think I realized it now because I, re I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back on it in previous job roles, I've just not had that purpose and things have fallen really flat. I've still had training goals and, and, and things, but actually when you, 
haven't got it on uh, kind of a personal development, as I said, or a career thing. Haven't got it there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't know it at the time, but now now I have those things in place. That's the kind of stuff that really lights a fire mm. for me, big time. So it's, it's a purpose, number one, knowing that I'm working towards something, both personally, you know, career-wise, whatever, uh, and having a, having a goal. High Rocks is a perfect example. I love it, I love it. So looking at another question here. So Shelley actually has asked, what is your training and background like on the physio side? Um, she said that you're clearly knowledgeable, but she'd love to know more. Where does the, the whole kind of the physio element tie into what you're doing with the personal training side of things? So firstly, definitely not a physio. I just want to make, yeah, we need to make okay. that very, very clear because um, that, that word gets thrown around a lot. Yeah, definitely not a physio. I'm sure there'll be some legal thing or a complaint somewhere. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not a physio. So I am trained up as a level five sports massage and remedial therapist. That's basically kind of my background in, in the kind of hands-on stuff. But I guess my passion for that kind of work came again back from, from playing rugby uh, and actually just getting injured a lot. Um, spent a lot of time on kind of physio tables and receiving treatment and exercises and that kind of stuff. That was the first thing that kind of really sparked an interest and a bit of knowledge around that stuff for me. Um, when I went to Virgin, and after we were just saying about uh, not having, you know, really the, the best kind of introduction uh, from an education standpoint going into uh, to that role, I latched on to one of the PTs there, Trevor, who's been there for probably about 10 years by this point. I think he's still there. Um, Shout out, Trev. <laughs> yeah, cheers, Trev. Um, but he shone out to me as someone who clearly just knew his stuff. And not only did he know his stuff, but he shone out very, very different from anyone else on the gym floor. And he was the go-to guy. If there was an injury or an issue, go see Trev. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, I have a little bit of an understanding and, a, and a, I guess an interest in the, the prehab rehabilitation side of things. This guy is doing it right in front of me. Like, I can see how different and the quality of his delivery with his clients versus some other people on the gym floor. I need to try and get as much knowledge out of this guy as I possibly can. So he was the first guy that I really just kind of latched onto and was like, I, I'm gonna try and milk this for all I, can, I possibly can. Um, and actually the time that I spent at Virgin was worth it for meeting him alone. Yeah. Like there's no doubt in my mind. Um, but past that point, I then just kind of carried on. I was a PT, I trained, blah, blah, blah. I then joined Beowulf Training, so a personal training uh, facility down in Purley at the time. And I was part of a group of trainers who were very, very good. There's about eight of us down there. But again, there was no standout. I, wasn't, I couldn't stand out from anyone because the level was so good. I'd gone from a place of, at Virgin where I probably stood out a little bit because of the quality that I had to somewhere where I was just surrounded by PTs at the top of their game, essentially. So I was like, I need something else to really make me stand out and make this probably more enjoyable experience for me as well. And that's where I went down the massage route um, and spent just over a year and a half basically delving into anatomy and physiology, working more with kind of hands-on stuff with the massage. Um, and actually got to a point where I was then asked to go back and train up to be a tutor. So I actually then taught that course for a little while. And when you start again teaching that kind of stuff, you really need to delve a little bit deeper and do um, some kind of self-learning around you know, the body and, and what it does. Yeah. So it was a kind of a, a career thing, but also just a bit of a, a, I guess a passion. Yeah. And you know, you can see a very real passionate to learn. About it. How's it helped as you in a career? Like, how's it helped with you working with individuals? I, I must have helped on the gym floor massively. Yeah, it, it, it has. It, it has, but it's, it's a really tricky one because you need to, I found that the people that I was working with initially almost didn't fit, fit the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The framework of them, the kind of where I wanted to go, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So I almost needed to find the clients who would really receive that information well. It's not the kind of person who just wants to come in, get beasted for 30, 45 minutes and then leave. So I had to kind of be in the right places around the right people that were gonna really benefit from the kind of stuff that I wanted to go into, if that makes sense. Yeah. So where I was going with that is it's, it's almost then been a bit of a blessing and a curse. It's great to be able to apply that and, and see it, but then you really start to see things and you almost start to then overthink or over program yeah. and sometimes give 
or try and give too much information. You know, you've got someone's shoulder blade who's winging and then you want to kind of fix yeah. that shoulder blade winging in, in a one limited session space or whatever, of time. And you, you just can't difficult. do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just not necessary. So it's, it's been a blessing and, and a curse. But definitely in, when directed right in the right kind of settings around the right people, definitely a blessing. Yeah, love that, man. So there's a couple of questions and I think this is going to really help these individuals. There's two or three questions around obviously somebody who's taken action on their health and fitness and they want a little bit more clarity on a little bit on training and nutrition. So one of the questions here is what's more important, focusing on your training or focusing on your nutrition? Where would you start with that? Oh, that's tricky. The magic question that. I would say nutrition. I think nutrition over the two. And the reason I say that is I've been a, a few times, I've been in a place where my training was okay. I was quite consistent with my training. I was, you know, doing what I needed to do on the training front, but my nutrition wasn't that great. But actually, when I think about the bigger picture, I probably wasn't in a very good place. I, I was low on energy, low on motivation. I was still making the sessions happen. My productivity wasn't that good in a workplace. I probably wasn't a particularly nice person to be around uh, at times, quite stressed and like I say, just, you know, just low on, 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 on energy and there was no fire basically. But I've also had it the other way when nutrition has been my main focal point and it levels everything up the clarity is better, output productivity at work is better. I'm a nicer person to be around at home and obviously has a massive a positive Im impact on your training anyway. Um, and not just the output in the session, but the recovery side of that as well. Yeah. So I think as a well-rounded kind of approach, the nutrition is definitely the, the priority or the, or the thing that stands out more over the training. And where would you start with that? Let's say somebody wanted to build some strength, lose some body fat, where would you start on a nutrition front? Would it be just looking at some simple portion sizes on a day-to-day, -day, three meals a day, tracking macros and calories? Where would you start? I think the starting point has to be just getting an understanding of where you are. Um, whether it be, you know, tracking through an app or writing things down, just having an understanding of where you currently are is is, is the first the first thing and can be extremely, extremely beneficial and quite, uh, it can hit quite, quite hard sometimes. I've had a number of people do food diaries for me in the past or whatever. And they're like, wow, when I actually wrote this down, I had no idea yeah. that this is what I was taking on or what I was consuming or like I say, the portion sizes. Um, and that's before you even start going into the actual macronutrients of it. Yeah. So I think number one is understanding where, where you currently are. And then from that point, it's just setting yourself small achievable goals moving forward. And it mm. might not be a complete overhaul. And that might work for someone going kind of all guns blazing. I, it would kind of work for me that way because I know I need my willpower is terrible, yeah. so I know that I need to be like boom, all or nothing. Yeah. But I would say for most people, it's just work on the one thing. So when you know where you are, it's like, can I just work on my protein content or my intake? I should say, um, to start with, and when I get that really consistent, what's my next thing? Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. It's it's an interesting one because I think a lot of people identify that they've got a gap with their training but don't always necessarily identify that they've got a, a problem with their nutrition. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes when I speak to a lot of people who join the gym here, they know that they need to train, they know, they know that they need to move, they need a coach, they need support, accountability, guidance, and a program to follow. But oftentimes they won't identify that there is a big issue with their food. Mm -hmm. And like you said, until you write it down, until you actually look at what you're having, a lot of the time you can just skip over things that you didn't think were either that bad well, you didn't even realize you ate. <laughs> it's yeah. just habit. Yeah. You know, eating the, the amount of people I speak to say that they eat the kids' food when they don't eat it all. Um, even some coaches, I'm not yeah. going to say names. Mate, but 100%. <laughs> the thing is, Cass, this, if you're watching, <laughs> this stuff creeps up on you. Yeah. Um, I actually recently had a conversation with some of the coaches upstairs, and <laughs> I've, over the last, I don't know, probably two months, actually, for the first time in a very long time, I've actually tracked my food. Like, to the How's that been? As, it's been, it's been, very eye-opening and I'm someone who knows about this stuff because you thought you weren't eating that bad and then you've tracked and gone wow I, not because I was obviously with the prep for, for high rocks I knew that with my training being as it is at the moment I knew that the nutrition side needs to be on point to fuel that to recover from that but also just to shift some timber I knew that I needed to be on point so it's more from a I guess accountability standpoint more than anything else but 
actually now looking at it the biggest takeaway has been just understanding about really what i was putting in yeah um and <laughs> i'd clearly got into some bad habits so i had tracked like week i think week one week two i tracked a bowl of granola um <laughs> and I, i'm not sure if i told you this a bowl no, of granola I imagine and <laughs> i weighed it out had the scales there the whole nine yards thinking okay bowl of granola can't be too bad this is like i know 10 p.m 30 before. grams 30 like, grams as recommended on the back on the thing and i was like well that can't be right yeah. so anyway i put in what i would normally put in just eyeballed it this is what i would normally pour myself so the granola went in logged that looked at the milk put that in weighed it out you know the whole nine yards i think i put i definitely put yogurt on it as well and then I went in, put the old biscoff on top. I was like, you know, that's little treat. I've got a healthy bowl of granola here. Yeah, yeah. Bit of, bit of uh, yogurt on there, it'd be fine. I can treat myself to some of the biscoff. I totaled it up. This bowl of granola was over a thousand calories. Wow. A thousand calories. And you think you're eating something healthy? Yogurt, Completely. granola, maybe a little bit naughty with the biscoff, but yeah. But I was teaspoon. allowed to treat myself with the biscoff yeah. for having something that actually was quite quote unquote healthy for wow. me and, and, and pretty low calorie at that time yeah. of an evening before getting up early in the morning. So the portion size thing is is huge. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people can resonate with that. I, yeah. I actually promote anyone watching this right now to go and weigh out their next yeah. bowl of cereal, granola. I mean, cereal is also another massive one yeah. for me. Like when I've, when I've tracked, I'm like, I could easily do 90 to 100 grams. Yeah. And on the back, it says 30 to 40 grams. I'm like, I can possibly. Yeah. It is, it's it, insane. Yeah, and that's I like will, a, a couple will, of mouthfuls. I need, you know, at least I would 10. also point out that I actually didn't eat it. Wow. I, I Rate completely that. refused to eat it because I was actually livid. I was fuming. I was like, I'm not doing it. I was like actually pissed off by it. So I, I had to ditch the that's, whole bowl. That's mental. Well, while we're on the topic of food, we've got uh, an interesting question here. Um, it's actually about Jackie Potatoes. And there's been a bit of controversy on the stories a couple of months ago. And this person has asked, what's JT's it's opinion? This person, we know exactly who it is. Yeah. She might be around. Yeah, she's around somewhere. Yeah. What's yeah. JT's opinion on Jackie Potato, cheese, beans, and tuna combo? And they put a little emoji, the love heart eyes. What's your opinion? I, I don't even know where to start with this, really. There's, there's we could a, lose there's some a, subscribers. There's a, long, there's a long answer and there's a short answer. And the short answer essentially is it's just... It, awful why just re re repeat the ingredients on that if it gets one more time for we've me. got jacket potato fine cheese beautiful beans understandable and tuna awful where are you getting your protein from the beans and the okay cheese. let's talk about the tuna but because it, it, but it, it's the, the, the idea you have a bit of mayo with that the I, tuna and mayo i get it tuna and mayo on a jacket on a jacket spud i get it when you start in it's i, I got a problem with the cheese and tuna anyway so the cheese and tuna like in a melt Although I have tried it now, I hadn't before. It's okay, not you had an issue bad. with that, right? Uh, mate, cheese and chew? No, it's, I, I can't it's understand nice. it. That's when nice. you start adding in beans to that situation, you've got essentially kind of like tomato sauce in there. Yeah. Why, who's putting tomato sauce with fish? Like tuna? I must say, it is a weird combo. I don't get it. But I think we've just been conditioned at school. We'd have lunch. <laughs> we didn't like the lunches, so we would just always get cheese beans jacket potato and i'd always get tuna on the side because that was like the it was you go to the canteen it'd be like da 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 that'd be the step no, like step one just, jacket step two cheese step three beans then tuna then back to the cheese to finish off and then it just become I, a household rate, name at home. I, can, I completely understand the cheese and the beans i get that melted melted cheese over beans on a jacket spud i'm, I'm there for it all day tuna mayonnaise on a spud also there for it all day <laughs> When you start we're gonna, have to go that, a, we're gonna have to film us going out for a meal or something at the uh, calf Can I, I, I just i can't i can't get on board with it i am still slightly willing to be proven wrong i will try it okay i have said that fair enough but the idea of it, nah, it right. watch this space confidence watch for sure. this space okay so just going back to to the exercise side of things and training and nutrition so talk to me about exercise and what like this person's asked what's the most underrated exercise and i guess it depends on what this person is looking for but let's say yeah. somebody's looking to build some strength let's let's be a bit more specific what would you say is a is a very underrated exercise that a lot of people potentially avoid don't do but has a huge roi that's a really tricky one but like i say firstly let's just go back to the fact that it depends 
So the, the exercise is very much going to depend on the person, the goal, kind of where they're at. Uh, you know, an extreme example is the the most underrated exercise for a power lifter is probably going to look very, very different to the most underrated for a marathon runner, for example. So it does really depend on the person um, what is in their program and kind of where they want to go with it. That's the first thing to kind of clear up and get out of the way. I, I, I'm going to give you match my answer first though, then come back to your point. Okay. So I think one of the most underrated exercises going, and this, is, this might sound like a slight cop out, but I'll give him my reasons, is walking. So it's actually not gym based in the slightest. And it can't be gym based for it to kind of give you, um, for it to fit why I think walking is, is one of the most underrated. Get outside and walk. I think it is one of the most underrated things. Um, and I appreciate it's probably not the, the thing that people would want me to say, but not only is there health benefits benefits to that, I think the psychological benefits are are huge. You know, if we ever get some sun in this country, you know, the vitamin D, all that kind of stuff, but getting out, spending time, as I mentioned earlier, walking the dog or listening to a podcast, you can use it to that time to educate yourself, have a yeah. little bit of free time. Um, get out of a building that you're in all day, get away from screens that you're attached to. It's not going to make you, you know, sweat, give you a pump, all that kind of stuff that we kind of typically think when we think exercises. But I think one of the most underrated things is getting outside and just moving, doing something that you enjoy. Um, but walking, it has to be outside. It cannot be on a treadmill. Get outside, even if it's pouring with rain, get outside in the elements. Love and I think it's one of the things that if people did more of and just increase that step count, the, the, the clarity that you can get from that yeah. Um, it is, is huge. 100%. I love it. What are your thoughts on protein shakes? I'm probably not the best person to ask about protein shakes, really. I've, I've definitely used them um, in the past, more so when I was younger. And I was trying to bulk up for rugby and I was just trying to whack pretty much anything in yeah. that I could. That granola would have been good. Well, the granola would have been perfect. <coughs> I wouldn't have touched the tuna and the beans still, but um, <laughs> the granola would have been perfect. I think, I think they're okay. Uh, I think we're inundated with a number of different protein you know, shakes that claim to be the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. I think simplicity with your protein is, is important. I don't think we need necessarily half the stuff that people whack in their, their protein shakes. I get it as a supplement. Uh, if we are struggling to get you know good nutrients in or uh, calories in if you're looking to build muscle, whatever it may be, I get it as a recovery tool to a certain extent. But it has to be, it is a supplement to yeah. a good, healthy, nutritional regime, if you will. Yeah. We have to have the other stuff down. And the, if we can, if you can get what you need from food and from good quality food, then I don't see the need to have the protein shakes. If you're really struggling time-wise on the move, whatever, yeah. or you're struggling to get the calories in if you needed it, or the protein content, then I think they have their place. Love it. Great answer. Okay, so let's move on to a lighter topic. Let's talk about socks. A lot yeah. of people here are curious about the socks. Somebody asked, this is the first question actually on the Q&A, what's with the odd socks? Yeah. First, I need, to, I need to clarify that they're not odd. Okay. That's, so they're not odd. That's a pair, yeah? Because odd sounds like it's a mistake. Right. So the... I, no, this I is think, important then. This is I an think important the question. Pair of, uh, yeah, it's actually quite good to be clear this up. So mm. I, I think... The, the pair of socks that they're referring to, because I actually had questions. I've had a number of questions actually on the gym floor about this. <laughs> yeah, were you in a rush this morning? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. The socks are meant to be that way. And they are a set of, a pair of stance socks. Yeah. Um, if stance want to throw any, you know, freebies this way, you know, get the Sponsor the pod. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sponsors. Um, there's, they're an American flag. They're stars and stripes. So one foot you have the stars and the other one you have the stripes okay um i have the colored version i have the black and white version as well so they're not odd they are actually meant to be and they're designed that way um it's not a mistake number okay. one so how big this is another question how big is his collection of stance socks it's not that extensive in fact i'm definitely I, I need to have a proper rehaul, like overhaul of the of the mm. stance collection for sure. It's got to be done sometimes. I think Christmas periods are good for that. Check the boxes. Hundred percent socks. I I know for a fact I will get stance socks for Christmas. Well, hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, I reckon I've probably currently got 
about 12 pairs of stance socks. Wow. Socks? Socks, something like that. I reckon somewhere in that region. I couldn't tell you exactly. But I bet you still run out of them. Isn't that, th- yeah, yeah. Isn't that with socks? Like I've, I've honestly got so many socks. But I'm like, you know when you need them? Like, yeah. Where the hell are all my socks? It's true. Or they go missing. It is. One goes, one's go. That, that's what I thought actually happened with the socks. I thought one went missing, so you just paired another two up. I do, I do feel like my tumble dryer eats them sometimes. I think that I, there's got to be a hidden compartment in there somewhere where I've be, got about it? six pet, like <laughs> individual stance socks somewhere. But I need some more. So like I say, stance, fix me up, sort me up. All right. So last couple of questions. How can you reduce overwhelm when on a weight loss journey? Um, I think it's the same whether it's a, a weight loss journey or you know a weight gain journey whatever it is whatever the goal i think it's number one understanding where you currently are and actually we we spoke about this a lot actually uh, on on saturday at the summit you gotta really understand number one where you are number two be really really realistic about the obstacles that you face and then off the back of that try and figure out some real high quality solutions to those problems and then set some very small achievable goals and get the ball rolling. I think quite often, like I say, whether it's a weight loss goal, weight gain goal, whatever the goal may be, we make sometimes extremely harsh decisions. Sometimes they're not even our decisions that we've made ourselves, and we're really invested in. Someone else mentioned something and you're like, oh, okay, well, I guess I must pull my pants up and get moving. It's like, okay, this is something I really want. My buy-in is very, very strong. And I'm going to go, this is where I currently am. So X, Y, Z. These are the problems or the challenges, the obstacles, the barriers that I'm going to face. Be really honest, be open and realistic with those. And then figure out, okay, I know I'm going to have these obstacles. What things can I do? What things can I put in place to help me overcome them? Because then when they do happen, it's not, a problem you've already thought about it mm. and it's the kind of thing that normally would stop someone in their tracks and we become overwhelmed it's like well there's too many things going on i can't do this i can't do that but if you've already been realistic about it and you've thought about ways maybe around those those hurdles then you're already one step ahead mm. if your achieve your things are achievable and they're just small steps in the right direction again it's more achievable so if you are you know you have to hit the whole audible button pretty lively because something's come up the steps in place are small enough that you can still achieve it or you can get very, very close to it rather than just being, you know, uh, a step that's just too too big, too large, too soon maybe, too early. And it seems that when you do have to audible and go down a maybe a slightly different route because something's cropped up that you're not sure about or that you didn't really foresee, there's no way you can get there. You can't match where you should be or get close to that step because it's just too big in the first place. So in a nutshell, Understand, I'm going to start that again. I'm going to say, make sure it's your goal and you have a deep enough buy-in, number one. Number two, have a real, real look at where you currently are. Think about the obstacles, the challenges and the hurdles that are going to be in your way between now and if there's a deadline, a deadline. Have clear solutions in place, ideally more than one, of ways to get over those barriers. And then off the back of that, have small realistic specific actionables that you can implement on a daily basis boom love that that is awesome mate okay this person has asked this is the penultimate question by the way hi jt do you have a favorite inspirational quote or motto that guides your approach to coaching um no is is the short answer no i I don't know i've not even gone looking for for quotes or mottos really um i think the thing that kind of guides my approach to coaching now is just having a better understanding that everyone who come like who who comes into the gym whether it be you know one to one or in a group or whatever everyone is different and it's being able to ensure that no matter what they're here for no matter what you know their goal is the reason for being in the gym that day that they leave with something and that they feel that they've achieve something that day so you know especially in a small group setting like we have here you have you know, maybe six people maybe even up to 16 people on a large group side who are probably going to be in very different places that day in their life in general you know they're very different reasons why 
they've even decided to join the gym in the first yeah, place. Yeah. I think having more understanding and a better respect for that um, and then having a better understanding of how I can help individuals on an individual basis get something from that hour, that half hour, that day. That's kind of my main focal point now when it comes to coaching either a group or a one-to-one -one basis. It's having appreciation for those things and being able to tailor it to the individual so they get something regardless of what they're here for. Power. Love it, mate. Last question. I know this is a question that's on a lot of people's minds. Are you and Luke going to get a sub 60 minute at High Rocks this November? I should say yes, right? Yeah. I know it's, it's, it's firmly embedded in, in, in for you, for sure. Yeah. Like you, you're, as far as you're aware, it's, it's happened. already happened, right? Yeah. I know it is for you too. I, 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 think, I think it's achievable. I think it's doable. I think it's very tough. I think it's very tough. And if the wind's blowing in the right direction on the day, if they can you be wind in the it. XL in London. Um, but if it's, all, if it's all going the right for us on the day and I can keep tabs on you in the first couple of laps and you don't sprint <laughs> off at like a yeah, yeah, 2.30 yeah. per kilometre pace on those runs, yeah, um, that's going to be the toughest thing. I think. I think is, uh, is actually humbling. Like just a leash on you, taking the foot off the gas, not going out too quick, too soon. No, I, I think I think I, th I definitely think it's doable. At the start, when we kind of, well, I say when we, when you initially set that as a, as a goal, I was like, mate, you need to you know, maybe lower the expectations a little bit. But in fairness, actually, you know, the training has been solid. We've been really consistent, super consistent, um, and you know, with the running in particular, it's been. Uh, a tough journey on the old 4.30 Wednesdays and the, the 4.30 yeah. Fridays. But uh, even up to, you know, this Wednesday, uh, definitely the runs are feeling a lot better, a lot smoother, yeah. faster, which is good. So we're on the right lines. We're on, we're on the right track. I've got a good partner um, who will drag me around. So um, absolutely. Yeah, we'll look for that sub 60 for sure. We're going to boss it. So there you have it, ladies and gents. Another episode. Just want to say a massive thank you to JT but also you for tuning in and spending your time with us. Uh, one thing we ask is just if you can subscribe to the channel. We're bringing out regular content every single week, every single month to bring more education, more value, more inspiration to you and your health and fitness journey. So hit that subscribe button and um, JT will be here next time. See you soon.